Thank you, Cheryl, for your music testimony. Thanks to all the band. Beautiful. And what a glorious morning of worship. I'm so happy for Emma and Zane and Zoe. We rejoice in your baptisms. And it, uh, it's, it's spectacular to have three students in our youth ministry, uh, actually more of them, who had a, an encounter with God, a faith and life-changing moment with God at camp. And to have three of them baptized this morning is just wonderful. So two weeks ago, we hit the pause button in the middle of Stephen's address to the Jewish council. Now you may remember Stephen was uh, one of the original seven deacons, and he emerged as a leader who was full of grace and power. But he was doing things that were really attention getting, not that he was trying to get attention, uh, but because of his impact, there were Jewish leaders whose, uh, who, who were threatened by Stephen and who resented what was going on. And so authorities conjured up false charges against him. And Stephen was hauled in front of the council to be interrogated. Now, this is actually the third time in the book of Acts when someone or ones following Jesus had to be investigated. The first time, it resulted in a warning. The second time, it resulted in a flogging and a warning. And the third time, as you'd expect, the climate is even more intense. And it did not end well for Stephen, at least not in earthly terms. Next week, we conclude this season of reading from the book of Acts. And spoiler alert, in case you didn't know it, Stephen is the first Christian martyr. He is the first one to lose his life because of his faithful attachment to Jesus. Because of what he says in, in that encounter in the, um, in the council, his address to them, he is hauled out and he is stoned to death. Next week, the message title is A Stone's Throw from Heaven. And we'll look at that. But today, let's try to understand what leads to that. What leads up to that? Stephen was specifically charged with statements undermining the temple and the law of Moses. He's accused of, by, by the way, those are two things you don't want to mess with. The tradition of the temple and the, the long-standing tradition of Moses giving the law of God to the people. And Stephen is charged falsely, but he's charged with saying things that were demeaning or undermining the temple and the law of Moses. And the high priest asked him, are these things true? Let's consider for a moment Stephen's strategy. He does not have a defense attorney. He speaks up for himself, which of course is understandable. That's the way it was. He doesn't issue a denial. There's no categorical denial. He doesn't try to discredit the witnesses against him. He doesn't come up with any alibi. He doesn't say that what I said has been misconstrued. He doesn't say, well, I did say it, but I was just being sarcastic. None of that. No, Stephen launches into a history lesson. He begins reciting the call of Abraham. And then he gives a kind of Reader's Digest version of the book of Genesis. A quick explanation of why the Hebrews were in Egypt in the first place. 
And then he moves on from that to tell the story of Exodus, the plight of God's people enslaved under Pharaoh. In spite of the oppression, they continued to grow in number. So Pharaoh installed a policy of infanticide the grotesque killing of all male children born to the Hebrews. Now famously, the mother of Moses conceals Moses for three months, as long as she can. And when that's no longer possible, you know, she waterproofs a basket as best she can and then lovingly, faithfully releases her son out into the currents of the Nile River, but not far from where Pharaoh's daughter and her attendants come to the bank of the river to bathe. And they notice this child, and they scoop him up into a palace life, raised with all that royalty has to offer. But Moses knows that he's adopted. He knows he has a Hebrew background. When he gets old enough, when he's, when he's a man, he wants to meet his birth family. He wants to get to know his people. So let's pick it up where we stopped now, reading in Acts chapter 7, verse 23. This is Stephen still addressing the council. Here's what he says. When Moses was 40 years old, which was a biblical way of saying a long time, more than a generation, it came into his heart to visit his relatives, the Israelites. When he saw one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his kinsfolk would understand that God through him was rescuing them, but they did not understand. The next day he came to some of them as they were quarreling and and tried to reconcile them saying, men, you're, you're brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor pushed Moses aside saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? When he heard this, Moses fled and became a resident alien in the land of Midian. There he became the father of two sons. Now when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. And as he approached to look, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses began to tremble and did not dare to look. The Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. I've surely seen the mistreatment of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their groaning, and I have come down to rescue them. Come now, I will send you to Egypt. It was this Moses whom they rejected when they said, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? And whom God now sent as a both ruler and liberator through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He led them out having performed wonders and signs in Egypt at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. And this is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up a prophet for you from your own people as he raised me up. He's the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our ancestors. And he received living oracles to give to us. Our ancestors were unwilling to obey him. Instead, they pushed him aside. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. saying to Aaron, make gods for us who will lead the way for us. As for this Moses, 
who led us out from the land of Egypt? We do not know what happened to him. <laughs> so how are you feeling about the reading so far? All right. In the email that I sent out to the congregation, many of you would have seen it, many not, on Thursday, I, I said Moses was an aggressive social justice warrior when he tries to step in to save one of the Israelites against the Egyptians. He was a meddling peacemaker. He was an escapist who seeks the wilderness, a curious fellow who talks to bushes, and a leader who loses his followers. When Moses went up onto Mount Sinai to receive the tablets, to receive the law, his people left him. I mean, they, they, they didn't walk away, but they, they rejected his leadership. choosing instead to make a golden calf idol. And that's what Stephen reminded the council, trying to make sure they see Moses was God's choice to lead the people out of slavery. Moses was God's choice to receive the, the law of God and to deliver that to the people. Moses was God's choice to guide the people for a generation and more through the wilderness. Moses was God's choice, but he wasn't always the people's choice. On numerous occasions, they rejected him. In spite of wayward, rebellious elements in his following, Moses still manages to fulfill his mission, and he gets the people of Israel to the edge of the River Jordan from whence they will cross over into the promised land. But Moses the hero, Moses the Exodus champion, Moses the lawgiver, is also Moses the rejected. He was rejected numerous times by his people when he was alive. And then posthumously, he was rejected every time people disobeyed the law of God that he had given them, which happened over and over again, continuously for centuries. And remember, Stephen is accused of blaspheming the law of Moses. He's accused of undermining, of demeaning the law. He is systematically going through history to point out places and ways that the people of Israel have been rejecting Moses all the way along. Wow. Stephen continued. Verse 41. At that time they made a calf, offered a sacrifice to the idol, and reveled in the works of their hands, but of their hands, not, not God's hands. They reveled in the works of their own hands. But God turned away from them and handed them over to the worship, to worship the host of heaven, a, a pagan deity, as it is written in the book of the prophets. And, and here he goes on to quote from the prophet Amos about rampant idolatry and apostasy, turning away from God. He reminds him, this is from Amos, did you offer to me slain victims and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? No, you took along the tent of Moloch, and the star of your God, Rephan, the images that you made to worship. So I will remove you beyond Babylon. These are, these are pagan deities. That, they're idols that they're following. And then Stephen picks up another image from the wilderness wandering. This time it's the tabernacle the tent of meeting or the tent of testimony that, that they traveled with and kept in the middle of their encampment. It was symbolic of what? It was symbolic of God's presence in the midst of them, wherever they went. Here's what he said. Our ancestors had the tent of testimony in the wilderness as God directed when he spoke to Moses, ordering him to make it according to the pattern he had seen. 
that he'd been told about could see in his mind. And our ancestors in turn brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before the, our ancestors. And it was there until the time of David who found favor with God and asked that he might find a, a dwelling place for the house of Jacob. God, they thought, dwelt in that tabernacle. And David wanted to build a permanent house for God. A temple. But he didn't get to do it. That was left to his son Solomon. It was Solomon who built a house for God. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made with human hands. Quoting, <coughs> quoting the Old Testament again. And he, he goes then to Isaiah. Isaiah says, heaven is my throne. This is God speaking. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hands make all these things? The most high does not dwell in a house made by human hands. Remember, Stephen was also accused of blaspheming the temple. The temple was the grand building project of King Herod decades before. It was massive. Impressive. Stephen used Isaiah to remind them that God doesn't live in anything that we have constructed with our hands. Nothing we build can contain God. Nothing we build can contain God. And in fact, Stephen is trying to say that our buildings, our campuses, our facilities, our land, no matter how grand and extensive it is, cannot compare with a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Stephen was saying, look, a relationship with God through Jesus is vastly more important than the lofty temple up on Mount Zion. By the way, within just a few years, a couple decades, that impressive temple will be raised. It's destroyed. It's leveled. It's gone by the Roman army. And Luke, who writes the book of Acts, as well as the gospel, Luke, by the time he writes that, he knows the temple is gone. He knows it. He knows Stephen was right. A great relationship with God is so much more important than great buildings. That's an important and healthy reminder for North Lake as we consider improvements to our campus and our building or, or what to do with eight and a half acres just down the road as we think about those sorts of things it, it's, it's, it's a healthy and helpful reminder for me and all of our leaders to be thinking what's really important here what's at the core of this as we're making disciples as we're baptizing folks what's at the core of this Stephen was clear So now we're almost finished with the reading. Almost. By the way, in 40 years of preaching, this is the long, by far the longest passage I've ever used in a message. And if I'm here another seven to 10 years, it'll probably still be the longest. Although I won't make any promises. Uh, but these, the, the reason I wanted to do that, these pieces of Stephen's address to the council, they, they need to be together so, so we can understand what's going on rather than broken up into lots of pieces. So I, I, I compromise and say, I'll break it into two. But I want you to see, he's telling this holy history to be able to show how Moses has rejected, Moses has been rejected 
by the people, not by him, but by others all through their history. And he's trying to point out how they have turned to idolatry over and over again, including the idol of their temple. The temple itself becomes an idol. And it gets in the way of true faith. The temple itself gets in the way of true faith in God. Okay, fasten your seatbelts. For the last three verses of Stephen's address, this is no way to win friends and popularity. In fact, Stephen turned to a sharp rebuke and an indictment of the Jewish leaders. You stiff-necked people. If there was any hope of conciliation and <laughs> compromise, it's over now, right? <laughs> if they thought he was going to be apologetic and kind of back off, forget it. It's over. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears. You are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one. And now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that received the law as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. The speech of Stephen starts almost like he is walking us through a museum of Jewish history. And the first room that he takes us to, the first room is the room that's about Abraham. And he spends a little time there on Abraham and, and the patriarchs, Jacob and Isaac and Joseph and how they got into, how they got to Egypt. Then he goes and he spends a long time in the room on Exodus. He spends a long time there. You know, in most museums, there's more information, more rooms and exhibits than you can possibly cover in one trip, right? So you, you have to kind of pick and choose where you're going to linger and what you're going to focus on. And Stephen, who is sort of the docent, the tour guide here, he spends a long time in that room on Moses. Why? Because he wants to show Moses has been rejected over and over and over again. And in fact, when he leaves that Exodus room, he starts to pick up the pace a little bit. He goes fairly quickly from that point on. He even skips some rooms. He skips a room on the judges like Gideon and Samson. And he skips a whole room on, on Samuel and Saul. He mentions David and Solomon in conjunction with the temple being built. But then he skips all the rooms that have to do with the centuries of other kings. He's just moving right along. Why? He's telling holy history with a purpose. He wants them to know that Moses was rejected over and over again. And that the people had rejected God. When you rejected Moses, it was also a way of rejecting God and turning to idols, including the idol of the temple. His speech is very purposeful because he also knows that every time they've rejected Moses or rejected God, it foreshadows what? It foreshadows the rejection of God in Jesus Christ. Most museum tours finish with an exit into the gift shop, right? <laughs> Hoping that you'll buy something on the way out that caught your fancy or some souvenir of what you learned or were interested in. Stephen doesn't finish the tour at the gift shop or anything quite so pleasant. Where does he finish the tour? <coughs> He finishes the tour at Calvary. He finishes the tour at the cross 
reminding the Jewish authorities of their role in crucifying Jesus. It's what he does. He regarded Jesus as the righteous one. He sees Jesus as the righteous one. And Jesus is not abolishing the Jewish faith. He's fulfilling it. He's fulfilling it. And that's, what, that, that, that's what Stephen is seeing and trying to convey. And he, and he says, look, counsel, you're, you're being hypocritical because you're not following the law of Moses like you want everybody else to do. You're not doing it either. You're a part of a long tradition of rejecting God. And you have become betrayers and murderers of the righteous one. Look, the righteous one. The only one who has kept the law of Moses perfectly. The one and only who has fulfilled the law of God just the way it was supposed to be fulfilled. And you killed him. And you know what? When Stephen said this to the council, he knew it was over for him. He knew it was over. And we'll conclude our season of reading the Acts of the Apostles next Sunday. Let's pray. God, thank you for the voice of Stephen, bold, convicting. We do not want to be in the number of those who are rejecting you. We want to live in a way that reflects our deep commitment and desire to abide with you. Even as we read this history in the book of Acts, the holy history, what we want is to see what you've been doing in the depths of the past that washes up onto the shores of our time and what it means for us today. God, we want you. We don't want a relationship with a building. We don't want a relationship with some illustrious figure of the past. We don't want some archaic religious system. We want you. We want to be in that relationship with you, which is life-giving, life-changing, and a relationship that has no end. Thank you for Stephen's confidence in you. All the way to the end and beyond. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the righteous one, the one and only. Amen. Uh...